Well, thank you for coming. And uh, hopefully everything will work. And we'll have a good time. Um, I wanted to uh, say, start off with a few sort of personal notes, give you kind of a little bit of a roadmap of what we're going to cover today, and then sort of dive in. Uh, this is going to be a bird's eye view, as Stovall said, of the supernatural worldview of Scripture. Um, we're going to cover a lot of concepts today that are going to be on the surface familiar. You know, here's sort of a little mini grocery list. You've heard a lot of these terms before, family, identity, mission, destiny, supernatural rebellion, family, those sorts of things. But I wanted to say up front that while a lot of the terminology is going to be familiar, I can guarantee that you're going to hear things today that are going to be quite new. And they might even be a little disturbing. <laughs> okay. uh, I, just a little bit of my personal story. If you've read uh, Unseen Realm or if you follow my podcast, my podcast is the Naked Bible Podcast. And we call it Naked Bible because we're just trying to teach Scripture with, you know, creedal formulations sort of stripped away, denominational distinctives and preferences stripped away. What I care about is that you're able to read Scripture in light of its original context, the context of the writers and their original readers. They come from quite a different world, and they think in ways that we as moderns are not used to thinking. And for my own story, uh, I was, I sort of had my watershed event, if you've read Unseen Realm, I relate this in the very beginning of the book, where I was a graduate student, doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin, and by that point I had taught for five years at a Bible college, I had two master's degrees, I was not a newbie uh, to biblical stuff. But one Sunday morning I was sitting in church, and a friend of mine who was also in the Hebrew and Semitics department was, was there. And you know, you know how it is. You have a few minutes to kill uh, before the service starts. And I don't remember what we talked about, but I'll never forget the way it ended. And he had his Hebrew Bible with him there. And he said, you need to read Psalm 82 in Hebrew. And I did. And what I saw there was life-changing. I'm going to show it to you uh, today. But I, the first thing that sort of popped into my head was, how in the world could I be a doctoral student and have taught five years, you know, 15, 20 different classes, and have never seen what I saw in the text that morning? And it, it just changed the way I, I viewed everything. And that sort of became, uh, you know, just a fire, I couldn't put it aside, and it led to essentially my dissertation, it led to the book we know as Unseen Realm, it led to the book we know as Supernatural, it led to essentially what I do. And in that process, there were some uncomfortable moments, because I had to make a decision to value what the text said more than what my tradition said, and that was difficult. I knew if I did it, I was going to lose some friends. I knew if I did it, I would never be invited to speak at this or that place. And, you know, it was just one of those watershed things. If we believe this thing we call the Bible is inspired, and we believe things like God decided, these are God's decisions, God decided to prompt individuals to produce this thing we call the Bible at a certain time, in a certain culture, in a certain place, with a certain worldview that is not ours, then we really ought to not impose our own worldview on the text. Okay? It, it's a simple idea. We, we should try to read them the way they wanted to be understood, what was going through their heads, because they're not writing from the perspective of a 21st century white guy, okay? They're just not. 
They're not asking the questions or addressing the questions that I have in my culture, in my time period. They're doing something different. Now, it all applies to us. But we have to realize the Bible, while it was written for us, it was not written to us. It was written to somebody else. And if we rightly understand that, then we will know that we're applying things correctly and we will be able to understand more of Scripture. I kind of specialize and focus on the weird stuff in the Bible. Okay? I have this little, I used to say this as a professor and it sort of caught on. If it's weird, it's important. Okay? And it, and it really is because there's nothing thrown away. It's not like the biblical writer is going about his business and saying, hey, I need something weird here. I got a few paragraphs to fill. <laughs> so, you know, this is part of the assignment, so I got to throw this in here. No, it's weird to us. But people living two or 3,000 years ago with an entirely different worldview would have known exactly what to do with that. They would have known why it's there, what it means, what role it plays in the bigger picture. We lose an awful lot when it comes to that. And because we do, we won't find some of the ideas that we'll talk about today in the creeds. We won't find them in our doctrinal statements. We'll just find them in the text, <laughs> okay? I mean, that, that, that's where we find them, in the biblical text. And what I want to do, uh, you know, I just want to, you know, sort of prep you a little bit. Mike, you're not going to hear Mike say, well, you thought the gospel was A, and Mike says it's B. No. The things that you believe, you know, I believe. I'm a normal, you know, evangelical guy. I know what the gospel is. I accept it. Christ is Lord. It's an exclusive claim. There is no other way of salvation. I'm a normal Trinitarian dude. Okay, I, all the boring things you can, you know, okay, I, I'm that too. But the reason why I think those ideas are coherent and arise from the text might be dramatically different than you've heard. Some of your favorite arguments for things, I might say, that's just a terrible argument. Okay? So I'm prepping you. I'm used to people looking at me like I've got two heads, so that won't bother me. I'm used to this kind of look. Okay? But I will take that over this. Okay. So now you know where I'm coming from. Okay. So let's jump in. You're not going to hurt me. <laughs> I'm not going to hurt you either. So let's start with Psalm 82. This was my watershed event. If you have a Bible, you can turn there if you like. I'm going to show you the text. I like people to see the text rather than what I say about it. And don't stress out, by the way, you know, if, don't feel like you've got to write down every word. I'm going to give the slides to Stovall. He'll put them up somewhere and you'll all get them. You can throw them on YouTube or whatever. You know, I, I'm on YouTube about, you know, 100,000 times and don't know how I got there. So it, it's okay. You'll get, you'll get the notes. But this was the passage that my friend on that morning in church said, you need to read this in Hebrew. Okay, it's in English, but I'll show you the relevant parts here. Let's just open up our little, if I can find my mouse here. Open up our little Hebrew section. The Hebrew line for verse 1 says, Elohim nitzav ba'adat el. God has taken his place in the divine council. If I click on God, I don't know if it'll, it'll show up. No. But you'll see in the blue column, you can at least see the blue column, we have the word Elohim. This is a word you've probably heard before. It's a standard word for God. Okay? Real easy. Well, it's not so easy when you go down to the second part of the verse. Bekerav Elohim Yishpot. In the midst of the gods, you'll see it's the same word, Elohim. He passes judgment. So when I read that on that Sunday morning in Wisconsin, I knew enough Hebrew grammar to know that the first Elohim was capital G, B 
because nitzav is a singular participle. Sorry for the grammar spasm, but that's why you know. But beker of Elohim yishpot, in the midst of, you can't be in the midst of one. You're in the midst of a group, and the group is referred to as Elohim, gods, plural. Now, my first thought was, okay, that looks like a pantheon. That looks like something we'd read about in Greek and Roman mythology. Fortunately, I had a later thought, <laughs> and that was, I'll bet Jesus knew that verse. I'll bet the apostles knew that verse. I'll bet the New Testament writers knew that verse. And somehow, it didn't deter them or deny a theology of one unique God and a trinity and a heavenly... I mean, so how do, how do we articulate what we believe about God as a trinity, God and the Godhead, and handle this verse? Because we don't want the trinity to be these gods here. Because if you keep reading the psalm, and let's just turn it off. If you keep reading the psalm, look at what God says to the other gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. And then he says in verse 6, I said, you are gods. Let me just creep that up a little bit. And you'll notice it's the same word again. I said, you are Elohim, all of you, sons, plural, of the Most High. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. That's not the Trinity. Okay, the Trinity's not corrupt. The Trinity doesn't need a verbal spanking from God. Okay, and they're not sentenced to death. So we have in this passage, verse 1, we have God speaking to a group of gods. Now, if you went, if you do what I did at the time, I said, um, well, you know, I'm going to go look at commentaries. You know, surely, surely some of my, you know, favorite scholars, you know, have addressed this question. And what you get is you get the idea in verse 1 that the gods in this council are people. They're Jewish elders. They're members of the Sanhedrin. They're Israelites. I know that sounds a little odd, but trust me. I mean, if you, I, I could open up commentary after commentary after commentary, and that is what you'll read. Jesus quotes Psalm 82, in fact, verse 6, in one of his debates with the Jewish leadership to defend his assertion that I and the Father are one. He isn't saying, look, quit, throw, you know, quit being mad at me because we're all just gods. Okay, we're, you're just like me and I'm just like you. It's not what Jesus was saying. He never said, you're just like me. Okay? But this is the common view. I ran into this everywhere, which was troubling because I knew that that just didn't work. If you go over to Psalm 89, let's just click on that. Psalm 89, and you go down, we'll start here in verse 5. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. There's another reference to that council idea. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones? Now, heavenly beings here, and ESV nicely gives us a footnote. In the Hebrew, it says, sons of God. Okay, sons of might is not a good translation of b'nai elim, sons of God. That's literally what it is. Here, this council of the sons of God, remember back in Psalm 82, God speaking to the Elohim, the gods, and then in verse 6, he says, he calls them sons of the Most High. Well, we know who the Most High is. That would be the God of the Bible. 
So these Elohim in Psalm 82 are sons of God, also called gods. Here we have sons of God in a council in the skies, in the heavens. Now the last time I checked my Bible, we don't have a bunch of Jewish guys ruling in the skies. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense. But that is what you will run into time after time after time after time. So when I'm confronted with this, you know, I, I'm having a bit of a quandary. You know, and it, it's, again, it, this, I, I, didn't, I didn't run into this in Sunday school. I went to Bible college. I never ran into this. I taught Bible college and Christian college. And even then, in class prep, I never ran into this. And here it was hitting me right between the eyes. And I couldn't just pretend that it wasn't there. I couldn't let it go. But I, again, I had confidence that this is the word of God. I'll bet Jesus knew this. I'll bet Paul knew it. I'll bet the apostles knew it. I'll bet the New Testament writers knew it. There must be a way to make this comprehensible. And what I had to do was I had to set aside the worldview that I had. I had to set aside what I had been taught in my tradition and just say, let's go with the text. At the end of the day, it's probably still gonna be standing. I'm not gonna hurt it. I'm not gonna harm it. If it's the word of God, it's not going to harm me. So let's noodle this. And again, this became you know, the thing that you know, drove me really through you know, almost 10 years of graduate school, coming to grips with this as an academic. And again, as an academic, my field is just, my specialty is this kind of stuff. So let's look at a couple other passages. I mean, if you, if you drill down into this, you're gonna run into other things that are kind of interesting. This is 1 Kings 22, starting in verse 19. Now, if you know a little bit about your Old Testament history, after Solomon passes off, you know, away, the kingdom splits. So you have the 12 tribes, they split into two kingdoms, 10 in the north, two in the south. The north is called Israel or Samaria. The south is called Judah. And you've got prophets running around in both kingdoms basically saying, we shouldn't be split up, okay? Because down there in Judah is where Jerusalem is. This is where we worship Yahweh. We should be 12 tribes worshiping one God. But in the north, they're off doing their own thing. They, they create an alternative worship center or centers, and they slide into idolatry pretty quickly. Now, in this scene, the king of the north is Ahab, again, who's probably the worst guy, maybe next to Manasseh, in the history of Israel, the northern kingdom. And he talks to the king of the south, the southern kingdom, who's Jehoshaphat, and he wants Jehoshaphat to partner with him in an alliance to go destroy a city. So Jehoshaphat goes up there, okay, I'll meet with Ahab, you know, why not? It's, it's kind of like South Korea and North Korea, you know. Let's just go up there and talk. And so he goes up there and Ahab brings out all the prophets of Baal and they do whatever prophets of Baal do. And they say, Ahab, you're the man, go up and conquer remote Gilead, you're, you're just awesome, you're gonna win. And Jehoshaphat's a little suspicious and he says, isn't there like a prophet of Yahweh around here that we could ask him? <laughs> and, and Jehoshaphat says, it's, it's not, it's, it's in the verses prior to this, it's one of my favorite lines. Ahab says, this is my paraphrase, yeah, we got one of those here and I hate that guy. <laughs> because he's, he's in prison, he goes, because he never prophesies anything good. <laughs> So that's verse 18. He's only prophesies evil, you know, to me. And so they bring Micaiah out at Jehoshaphat's insistence. And at first he kind of mocks the whole thing. He's like, oh, you know, yeah, go up there. You're going to win. You're great. You're Ahab. You know, he, like he's miming, you know, what Ahab's prophets told him. And Ahab gets a little ticked, like, come on, you know, give it to us straight. And so Micaiah says in verse 19, you want to know what I see? Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, hear the word of Yahweh. By the way, in your English Bibles, when you have all small caps, that is the English convention for the divine name, Yahweh. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord, I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne, 
and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at remote Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. So the, the members of the heavenly host who are, again, it's a council. God opens up, you know, you, you, if, you read, if you read the whole chapter, God has decreed that it's time for Ahab to die. He's finally going to be judged for his wickedness. And then the events ensue and we get to this scene. So God opens it up, not because he needs information. God's like, yeah, I want to get rid of him, but I can't figure out, you know. Like, <laughs> no, he, he lets them partner with him to decide how Ahab is going to be judged. And they have a little debate. One said one thing, another said another. And then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord. So we know that the members of the heavenly host are spirits. They're not Jewish guys in the skies, okay? <laughs> a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you know, God comes back, you are to entice him and you shall succeed, go and do so. And Micaiah says, now therefore behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of your prophets and the Lord has declared disaster for you. Now, God is omniscient. So if the spirit comes forward and says, oh, oh, call on me, you know, I got an idea. If it would have been a dumb idea, God would have said, oh, just go sit down, we'll call on you later, okay? He knows what's going to work and what isn't. But the point is, he has a counsel and he lets them partner with him in making certain decisions. You get the same thing in Daniel 7. We're not going to go through all these. We'll hit a couple more in a few minutes. But Daniel 7, this is the, the vision of the four beasts, which are four empires. And you get down to this scene in verse 9. Daniel says, as I looked, thrones, plural, that's a plural, has an S on it, thrones, plural, were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Again, we know who the Ancient of Days is. It's not a brain teaser. This is God. God is seated. The other thrones, you know, nobody's sitting in there yet. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. By the way, where have you seen that description before? That's Ezekiel 1. It's the same, you know, divine chariot throne description. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court, the council, council sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Heavenly books, by the way, are an interesting topic. We did a whole episode on my podcast on that. It's part of the job of the heavenly host to keep track of everything that happens, not because God needs information or God has a bad memory. It's, it's a metaphor designed to tell us that God doesn't miss anything. But look who participates in the proceedings. It's a heavenly council. So, I mean, you run into these things that are very easy to sort of read over. It, the, heaven, the, the supernatural realm has organization. It's not a chaotic mess. It's not a Keystone Cops scene. It has order and coherence. And the biblical writers, who are not privy to that world, it's the supernatural world, to describe its order and its coherence they use a metaphor that they're familiar with, the language of the royal court. God is king. He has a council. He has an administration. The administration has certain tiered levels. You run into this in scripture if you read your Bible closely. Now, going back to the matter of the plurality, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack this for you. It's not really that big of a conundrum, even though at the time it was, again, it was a conundrum for me and it was disturbing. But what I'm suggesting to you is that your Bible presumes, the biblical writers presume, and the biblical text says that the gods are real. They are real spirit beings. Some of them are loyal to Yahweh, spirit beings loyal to Yahweh. You know, we tend to think of them as angels, and I'll, I'll comment on that terminology a little bit later. 
But they're real. Some of them are loyal and some of them are in rebellion and they are hostile to God and his people. This is, pardon the pun, this is the genesis of spiritual warfare in scripture. It has a very long history. And when the Bible says in verses like these, my list here, that Yahweh is the God of all gods, the text means exactly what it says. It doesn't mean God is the God of these things that don't really exist. Why not just say God is the God of the Avengers? Or the DC Universe? Or SpongeBob, you know, Bikini Bottom, okay? Because those are all fictional characters. It gives no glory to God to say he's better than a fictional character. Okay, I'm better than that. And every one of you are. So when it says Yahweh is the God of all gods, it means exactly what it says. Now, why does this trouble us? Well, it's kind of obvious why this troubles us because we as Westerners, as modern Westerners, and again, I'm, I'm in there, we are trained by both our Western culture and our Christian traditions to believe that the word G-O-D, when we see it on a piece of paper, when we see it on a screen, when we see the letters G, O, and D, that those letters signify, and I catch this, this phrasing is important. We, we are trained to think that the letters G, O, and D signify a specific set of unique attributes. That things like omniscience, omnipresence, sovereignty, creatorship, those are all packed into the letters G, O, and D. So that when you put them together, it refers to a unique set of attributes. That's why it creeps us out when you put an S on the end. Because we have been trained to think a certain way about a certain word. Now, the biblical writers did not think that way about the word Elohim. How do we know, Mike? Are we just supposed to say, oh, that's nice, Dr. Heiser, you have a PhD, so I'll believe that. No. You get it by doing boring things, like looking up the, the 2,000 plus occurrences of Elohim and reading them all. Yeah, it's, a, it's a recipe for curing insomnia, all right? <laughs> so if you actually do that, you will run across the fact that the biblical writers use Elohim of four or five different things, just, you know, we'll use round numbers, say roughly half a dozen things that are not the God of the Bible. Now, that alone should tell you that the biblical writers, when they wrote out Elohim, they are not thinking of a unique set of attributes. Because if they were, they would never use the term of something else. They don't think about Elohim the way we are trained to think about G, O, and D. That's the disconnect. That's the problem. It's a problem in academia, and it's a problem just you know, in, general, in general interest in biblical studies, anybody who's interested. We're just trained to think that way. If you, I mean, we could go through different passages and just give you a few references. We have the God of Israel, Psalm 82.1. He's definitely Elohim. We have the council members who are not him because he's judging them for being corrupt. They're Elohim. The gods of the nations. If we looked up 1 Kings 11.33, we'd have, you know, Kamosh of Moab. We'd have Asherah, Ashtaroth, you know, the, these deity figures. They're also called Elohim they're not at the level of the God of Israel for the biblical writer. He's not, they're not thinking attributes when they write the word Elohim. The Shadim, Deuteronomy 32, 17. If we could click out to this. Now, in your English Bibles, this typically gets translated. It's over here in the NLT. Let me enlarge this just a bit so you can read it. They offered sacrifices, it's a reference to the Israelites, to demons. This is the word shadim. 
these are not the demons of the Gospels. By the way, we're, we're going to get into this later today. We're used to thinking of good guys, angels, bad guys, demons. That is really, really oversimplistic. Okay, there are different groups of bad guys. They are not all the same, and they don't, they don't derive from the same source or event either. But in this case, the Shadim, which are, it's a term, it's an Akkadian term that refers to a territorial entity. They are referred to as gods. They offered sacrifices to the Shadim, which are not God, no kidding, to gods they had not known. If we click on the word gods, again, you'll see that we have Elohim. So here we have, again, clearly lesser beings referred to by Elohim. 1 Samuel 28, 13, I'll just you know, run through this one without clicking out. This is the account of Saul going to the medium, it's often translated witch, at Endor to get information. Uh, the medium at Endor. So Saul shows up at her house. He, he has previously run out all the mediums and the necromancers and all, you know, all the occult, you know, figures, you know, out of, out of Judah. But he somehow knows where to find this one. <laughs> so Samuel has died and Saul's in trouble and God will not answer his prayers. And so he says, I need information from the, the supernatural world. So he goes to this woman's house. She doesn't know who he is. She finds out fairly quickly. I'm, I'm going to click out anyway. because It's kind of an interesting passage. So let's go down here just a bit. So the woman says, who shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud, a loud voice. It, kind of, it freaks her out. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. So something about being actually able to get Samuel, as opposed to hoodwinking this guy, or, doing, or getting to some other evil spirit, maybe that she's used to. She knows, I got Samuel here, and that means I'm in heap big trouble. Because this, this is Saul. This is who Samuel would talk to about the things of God. And then the king says to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. The word there is Elohim. The disembodied dead are referred to as Elohim. Now again, if this is about attributes, that's ridiculous. Okay, you know, an Israelite's dead aunt or, or deceased child or grandpa or grandma, they are not at the level of the God of Israel. They just aren't. It has nothing to do with a specific set of unique attributes. So what does it mean? Biblical writers would use Elohim as a word to denote and describe a member of the disembodied spiritual world. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with attributes. Yahweh is an Elohim. And there are lots of Elohim because there are lots of spirit beings in the spiritual world. But no other Elohim is Yahweh. And you don't get that theology from the word Elohim. Where you get it is you read the text carefully and, you've, and you realize this particular Elohim is described in ways that no other Elohim ever are described. This one is the creator. Not only of, of, all, of our, our physical world, the embodied world, but he's the creator of them, the other Elohim. He is sovereign. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. Not only do the biblical writers never describe any other Elohim in those terms, but they specifically deny those attributes to other Elohim. All an Elohim is, is a spirit being. Yahweh is an Elohim. No other Elohim is Yahweh. He is, I like to say, species unique. There's only one of those. But they're all Elohim because they're all part of the spiritual world. The disembodied human dead are Elohim. Why? Because they're no longer embodied. They are now in the afterlife. They're in the spiritual world. It's not very, a really hard concept, but it's hard for us 
because we never have this discussion. We avoid passages like Psalm 82, or we make up stuff about them and say, well, that's just a bunch of Jewish guys. There's nothing to see here, citizen, move along. And there are lots of passages like this. Now, I'm, I talked about hierarchy a little bit earlier. In the ancient Near Eastern conception of the divine, the supernatural bureaucracy, there are always tears. In the Israelite version of this, the tears are as follows. And you're going to see this graphic at the end of the day, and it's going to, it's going to kind of shock you because uh, it, it'll have a different context for our discussion. But at the top is Yahweh. Yahweh is more than one person at the same time. Now, you know, today we're not going to go through the Old Testament evidence. My dissertation was actually, actually included God as man in the Old Testament. The idea of a Godhead in the Old Testament. That's where, where, the, where Trinitarian thinking comes from, a Godhead idea. It begins in the Old Testament. So we have Yahweh as a Godhead at the top. The middle tier are the sons of God. This is not an ontological term. It doesn't tell you what a, what a thing is. It tells you what a thing does, what their role is. I have a book out on angels. I don't know if your resource center has this one. But we have another problem with the way we think about the supernatural world, and that is our vocabulary. Vocabulary works this way. If you're, you know, if, you, if you're an English major or semantics or you had a good high school English teacher, you know about semantics. It's word meaning. Words never have just one meaning. They denote different things. So there are terms that describe the members of the heavenly host in terms of what they are by nature. That's our fancy word ontology, what a thing is. And these are terms like Elohim, Ruchot, spirits. Okay, it just tells you what it is. And then there are terms that describe rank in hierarchy. Sons of God is probably the leading one for this because in royal bureaucracy of the ancient Near Eastern world, who got the most important positions? Typically family members. You know, there was wisdom in that because they're family, they'll do a good job, and they're family, I keep my eye on them. Okay? There is an upper elite that often included family members they get the really big administrative jobs. And then you have essentially like a, a bureaucratic staff that are essential to preventing chaos in an administration. In fact, because there's more of these, they're probably, you know, some of the most important. They are described with terms that describe the specific things they do. Angel is one of those terms. In Hebrew, it's malach. In Greek, it's angelos. It means messenger. It describes a task. What angel is is essentially a job description. Any given spirit being might take a message. When he takes the message, he's performing the task of a malak, of an angel, because it describes a task. Now, I'm going to give you a little heads up here. This is just to, to a little whet the appetite. Sons of God in the Old Testament and words like holy ones are overwhelmingly, in fact, almost exclusively used of members of the spiritual world. That is not true in the New Testament. They're the holy ones, and the sons of God are you. This is why Paul, in 1 Corinthians 6, when he's trying to get the Corinthians to stop fighting with each other, it's a really obscure passage. He says, look, why are you taking each other to court all the time? Don't you know that you're going to judge angels? You could also translate the verb there, rule over. Don't you know that you outrank them? Wow. If you look at the hierarchy, we're the children of God. In the next world, in the, you know, in the new Eden, we outrank them. The vocabulary is transferred from the supernatural world to us. I often get asked, why should I care about angelology, the supernatural world? Because the way God, and we're going to go through a lot of this today, the way God looks at his heavenly family, his heavenly host, his heavenly children, his heavenly bureaucracy, if you will, 
the way God looks at them and the way he involves them in what he does is a template for how God looks at you, how God looks at us, and how God looks at us as, as partners. Family and partnership, identity and mission. The supernatural realm is a template for our realm. But we typically avoid angelology like the plague, or we just say wacky stuff. It's a neglected area of serious biblical study. But we're going to see this again. Now, I often get questions, specific questions. I'll go through these quickly. This won't take too long. We'll finish on time. People often ask, well, what about those Bible verses that say there's none besides me? There's none like me. These are phrases that are not denying the existence of other Elohim because there are verses that affirm the existence of Elohim. So unless you love a hopelessly contradictory Bible, okay, we need to adjust our thinking. These are not statements of denial of existence. They are statements of incomparability. And that's easy to demonstrate. I mean, we could take a tour through Deuteronomy. We don't have time for that. But if you look at Deuteronomy 4.35, there's one of these statements. Besides me, there's no God. There's actually 11 variations to this. Uh, all kind of similar, but expressing the same thought. There's none besides me. Well, if you looked at Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 29, all the way up to Deuteronomy 32, 17, which we just looked at a few moments ago, you will see that elsewhere in Deuteronomy, the reality of other Elohim is affirmed. Okay, you don't have four or five affirmations, and then verse 35, we have a contradiction. All, is it, all that it's saying is there's a lot of Elohim. Yahweh is among them, but none of them are like him. He's unique. That's all it is. So, you know, these statements are not an obstacle to what I'm saying. This is my favorite illustration of this, and I'm not going to click out to save time here. But there are two occasions, Isaiah 47, and yes, believe it or not, the book of Zephaniah is good for something. Okay? <laughs> so, Zephaniah 2.15 <laughs> the poor minor prophets, man. They just <laughs> okay. These phrases occur in these passages. In Isaiah 47, it's the city of Babylon saying, there's none besides me. What? Babylon thinks that the, she's the only city that exists? She's denying the existence of all other cities? That's ridiculous. The prophet wouldn't say that either because the prophet's not a dunderhead. Okay? In Zephaniah, it's Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Different context. This is where he's doing his ministry. Nineveh says, there's none besides me. They're not saying, I'm the only city on the planet. All the other cities aren't real. No, it's saying, we're the best. We're incomparable. It's all it is. FAQ number two, why does God need a council? We looked at 1 Kings 22, we looked at Daniel 7. I will click out to Daniel 4, it's kind of an interesting passage. This is Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, remember Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and he sees a watcher that is a holy one here in verse 13 comes down from heaven and you know, they're gonna talk about his dream. And essentially the, the holy one, the watcher says, hey, I sure hope you like to eat grass because that's going to be your diet for a while. You're going to be driven insane. You're going to be temporarily insane as a judgment from God because of your hubris and your pride. And he, look at what he says here. You go down to uh, verse 17. He says, The sentence upon Nebuchadnezzar is by decree of the watchers. Plural. The word of the holy ones. This decision is according to the word of the holy ones, plural. But a few verses later, we see, let's scroll down here. Come on. Come on. Keep going. Let me go back here. 24. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a decree of the Most High. There's only one of those. 
So the same sentence, the same judgment on Nebuchadnezzar is decreed by a group and by the Most High. This is participation. God allows them to participate. And you say, well, well wh why does God need a council? The answer is, he doesn't. He just likes to do stuff like this. He likes to create beings who are like him and let them partner with him. God doesn't need anything. I like to, when I get this question, I like to flip it around and say, why does God need you? Why does God need the church? I mean, couldn't God like just decide who's going to be a believer and oh, we'll call it good now. I mean, I'm just tired of waiting for the great commission. I mean, good grief, you know, look, look what time it is here. Can't he do that? Why did, did God have to give the great commission? No. God could just make all these decisions himself. But he doesn't do that. He likes the family business, okay? That's what he wants. He wants children who are part of the family business. He's got supernatural children who work with him in that realm. He's got believers, human children of God in this realm who help him do what he wants done here. He doesn't need anything. What about Jesus? How can he be the son of God if other divine sons of God are real? Again, it sounds like a difficult question, but it's a really easy question. John 3, 16, you probably all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his... See, only begotten is what a lot of translations have. Only begotten son. Some have a better translation I'll get to in a moment. The Greek word there is monogenes. Now, in the old days of biblical scholarship, which was the first half of the 20th century backward, scholars thought that monogenes was composed of two Greek words. Monos, which means one or only. Mono, again, we can see that pretty easily. And then the second half they thought was from a verb, genao, to mean beget, like in having children. Monogenes, only begotten. That's actually where the translation comes from. Second half of the 20th century, that changed because there was more Greek material of the same Greek dialect as the New Testament, the Koine Greek. Actually, thousands and thousands you know, of lines worth of new material. And scholars were able to determine that, you know what, we were wrong about that. Monogenes actually comes from monos, and gene, which means kind, one of a kind, wow. unique. This is why some of your more recent translations will translate that term as unique or something like that. And the, and the really good sort of test case for that is Hebrews eleven seventeen. This is the Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith chapter. You get to Abraham and, and it says this, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in fact, was in the act of offering up his only son. Okay, Bible trivia time. Was Isaac Abraham's only son? No. He wasn't even the firstborn, generally speaking. You had Ishmael. Ishmael was the son of, of Abraham by Hagar. So, that tells you that the monogenes here, again, only son, let's just open up our interlinear pane, click on only, monogenes, it can't mean the only one that exists. It does mean unique. What, what was unique about Isaac? He's Sarah's boy, who, who could not have children. He is the son of the promise. That's why he's monogenes. And that's why Jesus is monogenes. He is unique. What makes Jesus unique among all other heavenly beings? He is Yahweh, who is unique. And that's actually why, Je and we're not going to go into John chapter 10, but that's actually why Jesus quotes Psalm 82 verse 6 in John 10 to defend his deity. He's saying, look, fellas, doesn't your own, doesn't your own scripture say, have God speaking to other sons of God? His point is that 
You know, there are other sons of God out there who are not human. They're supernatural. That's point number one, dudes. Okay, so when I say I'm more than a man, your own scripture says that that category exists. So don't tell me it doesn't. And then he had just said, I and the Father are one. So I'm not only like a member of the council in the supernatural world, I'm the Lord of the council. Come on. Okay, you know, I am him. And he follows that, he follows that in verses 37 and 38 by saying, the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. That's why he quotes it. You know, just, just stick it to him. I, love, I like when Jesus sticks it to him. <laughs> Significance, this is our last slide for, for this session. What I want you to take away from this, again, think of the template. The way God looks at his supernatural family and his partnership relationship with them is the way he looks at you. Because his supernatural family, do you realize this, existed before human creation. Okay, we're gonna look at that in the next session, but in Job 38, the sons of God were witnesses when God laid the foundations of the world, and then God goes on to create humankind. He already has a family, God already has kids. Okay, before we get to Adam and Eve. And his relationship with them and his partnership with them are going to serve as a template for what he wants on earth. 